Welcome, everyone, to the EECS Colloquium. Uh, today, we have one of our own as the, our speaker. Uh, Peter Abiel is, of course, a professor here at UC Berkeley in ECS. He's also at Embodied Intelligence, uh, a new startup company. And uh, he's one of the founders of GreatScope, which many of you have probably uh, come across either as students or TAs in your courses here at Berkeley. Uh, Peter received his BS and MS from uh, KU Leuven in Belgium and his PhD in computer science at Stanford. Um, his research is at the intersection of machine learning, robotics, and control. Now, we overlapped at graduate stu as graduate students at Stanford. I think it was a year or two ahead of me. And back then, he was known around campus as the guy who would fly helicopters autonomously upside down. And then once I followed in his footsteps to Berkeley, um, his group developed a reputation of making the PR2 robot from Willow Garage do uh, entirely new feats, such as um, picking up and folding arbitrary laundry items. Now, underlying all these amazing applications are um, deep and pioneering techniques in reinforcement learning, imitation learning, unsupervised learning, and uh, meta-learning. His work's been featured in the popular press, pick any outlet, New York Times, Wired, uh, MIT Technology Review, Peter is there, and he's also won a long list of awards such as the Sloan Research Fellowship, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research Young Investigator Award, the MIT TR35, the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society Early Career Award, and the Dick Volz Best US PhD Thesis in Robotics and Automation Award. Please help me in welcoming Peter Beal. Thank you, Brian. All right, my presentation here will be with my uh, research hat on, but um, if you're interested in putting more AI and robotics in your manufacturing and logistics operations, come talk to me, or if you want your grading to happen automatically, also come talk to me. <laughs> a lot of the work I'm doing here is motivated by this video over here. This is a video from around 2008, and what we're watching here is the PR1 robot developed by a few PhD students at Stanford and Ken Salisbury's lab. And the PR1 robot is doing a lot of the chores that we wish robots would be doing for us. But there's a catch. And the catch is that this robot is actually being teleoperated. Eric Berger, one of the students, is sitting inside a harness and puppeteering every single motion the robot is making. So actually, it's more time consuming to do things this way than to do it yourself. But what it means for us computer scientists is that at this point, the problem is largely a computer science problem that is an artificial intelligence problem because we have the hardware that in principle could do the job. Well, do we really have the hardware? Um, Willow Garage released a PR2, but it was $400,000, so maybe not everybody would, would buy one right away. Um, then four years later, um, Rethink Robotics came out with Baxter for $30,000. Um, Unbounded Robotics, since transformed into Fetch Robotics, came out with the UBR1 for $35,000. Fetch is a little more expensive than that one. Um, and so I've been hopeful for a while now that in 2017, another four years later, we'll do another factor 12 of the price. And uh, well, we have uh, three months left. It still has to happen, but uh, I remain hopeful. Um, now, what's the problem setting that we're trying to solve here? It's not a standard machine learning problem when we build an AI for robotics. It's actually a learning problem with a feedback loop. So this is a robot, this environment around the robot. Then, based on the current state of the environment, your AI agent is supposed to make a decision, choose an action given current state, that action gets executed, then robot and environment change, and this repeats over and over and over. So you're dealing with the consequences of your own action in this kind of setting. Um, what are we optimizing for? Uh, reward. So any problem in robotics that you tackle this way, you define a reward function, for example, quality of the cooked meal, time to get to a destination, maybe negative reward for getting into an accident, things like that. And so your reward defines what you care about and, what you, and how you specify your problem. And then what you try to find, hopefully automatically, is a policy pi theta that optimizes reward over time. This isn't just in robotics, by the way. There's a lot of spaces, uh, problem spaces where you can apply this. Marketing, advertising, where you repeatedly interact with the same customer, uh, dialogue, um, anything where there is after your action something that changes in the environment that we have to deal with the consequences of that change. This brings new challenges compared to supervised learning, which is the standard pattern recognition kind of learning. We have an input corresponding output, and you try to find the pattern between input and output, like an image recognition or machine translation and so forth. What are the new challenges? 
Stability is a challenge because this feedback loop can destabilize if you have a poor controller here. Credit assignment, because you're learning this controller, when something good happens, you need to somehow understand what it is that you did in the past that made this good thing happen. If you're a robot cooking for half an hour, somebody at the end of the half hour gives you a five star rating. What was that you did right in that half hour to get that rating? Maybe some things you did wrong and so forth. Exploration. Um, if you want to learn to do well, find a good policy. You have to try things you haven't tried before. Otherwise, you're not going to acquire a new skill. And how to do that cleverly is a big challenge. Despite all these challenges, there's actually been a lot of breakthroughs over the past few years in solving this problem. What I mean with that is reinforcement learning algorithms that train this policy pi theta so that it becomes a good policy through just trial and, uh, trial and error in the environment it's placed in. For example, you could look at video games. The challenge here would be learn to play these games where your neural net, let's say it takes in raw pixel values, is supposed to output the action to take in the current situation. So you need to do image processing, control decision making, all that needs to be learned to somehow lead to good behavior in the game. Quite a few results, starting with the 2013 DeepMind results, um, also some out of Berkeley, the TRPO results, some more DeepMind uh, results, variants of DQN, um, showing that this is now possible. You can train from scratch a deep neural net to play these games. And what's interesting here is that that deep neural net can be the exact same architecture and run the exact same algorithm when you go to the next game. It'll just learn different parameters that are appropriate for the new game. So a very general approach. Um, similar idea has been applied to Learn to Play Go, classical game that people for a long time thought would remain out of reach for computers for much longer than it did. Um, here's another problem, continuous control. So now the inputs here will be joint angles, joint velocities, the output torque at each of the motors. Reward function is the further you go to the right, the better, and the less impact with the ground, the better. Here we are actually seeing the learning in action. Initially it's not doing well because it's initialized with random parameters and random parameters don't lead to good behavior. Um, it's a pretty random mapping from input to output. But over time, it makes sense out of the better attempts, the worse attempts, differentiates them from that, calculates updates to the weights in the neural net, finds a better neural net that can control the robot better and collect more reward. The beauty here is that the algorithm used underneath trust region policy optimization can be used without change to optimize the neural net to learn to play Atari games or to learn a neural net to learn to control um, a different robot. And so what's really intriguing here is that while classically if you were worried about let's say locomotion, you would study the specifics of two-legged locomotion and when you switch to four-legged robots, you look at a whole new literature about how you stabilize four-legged robots. None of that is happening here. You don't need that expertise. You just need a simulator and expertise in how these learning algorithms work and it'll learn to control the systems. Actually, a little caveat that you also find out when you run these things is that if your simulator has any bugs, for example, there was no way that robot could run that fast in reality, then this algorithm will find, help find those bugs for you because it'll do something that's unrealistic and you can go fix your simulator. Here the reward function is distance of the head to standing head height. The closer to standing head height, the higher the reward. And so over time it figures out a way to get up. Again, with zero prior knowledge about what standing means, it's just measuring distance of the head to standing head height, it figures out the right thing to do to stand up. Here's another one. With a real robot, this is the PR2 that uh, Bjorn was alluding to. Um, PR2 has been programmed to fold laundry, but here what it's doing is learn to stack Lego blocks. And what you see here is something that takes about 15 minutes when run in real time, learn to stack the block onto that corner uh, spot. starting with zero prior knowledge about the environment or about its own arm. Here's another robot we looked at. This is in a collaboration with NASA for uh, their planetary exploration projects. This is the Super Bowl robot. It's a robot that's essentially cables and rods. And the beauty of this robot is that you can compress it to be near planar. Makes it easy to ship, very small volume. And then it can expand, but it can also withstand impact on landing. Now the question is, there's no wheels here, there's no legs, how do you make this thing, this thing move and go where you want it to go? Turns out that you can pull the cables to shorten edges on this uh, contraption. If you shorten edges, the center of gravity will shift and it might tumble. And then you might do this again, again and again and get this thing to roll. 
Actually, very hard to design a controller for that. It turns out with um, reinforcement learning techniques, it was possible to design a controller, that is, have a controller be learned um, that can reliably roll the Super Bowl robot, in fact, the real robot, not just uh, in simulation. And this was the first time this robot was able to do continuous rolling as opposed to the hard-coded controllers the best people had gotten to was one tumble and then a long relaxation phase and then another tumble and repeat. So what this shows is that it is possible to have reinforcement learning result in mastery of a new skill. And it actually masters it pretty well, essentially often up to human level, even beyond. Uh, for example, for the game of Pong, a good human might score 9.3 in this game, whereas DQN was able to achieve 18.9, which is higher. But the experience needed to get to 18.9 18 was a lot more. 40 days of experience to learn with DQN, two hours for the human. And so one could uh, easily kind of conclude here, and I would say so, that this is pretty slow learning compared to this, which is much faster learning. And what we really want is fast learning, not slow learning. And so everything I've shown to you so far has been successes of slow learning. And it's nice if you want a problem solved and you're willing to wait for a long time, it'll solve it for you. Just sit there, wait a few days or 40 days. You might get the solution. But often you want to solve many problems. You want a robot that can solve new problems when it encounters the new problems and so forth. And you don't want it to take another 40 days before it does the next thing. So how can we get to much faster learning, more like human level learning? Well, let's take a step back for a moment. Um, at a high level, what have we seen in computer vision? This is a slide I borrowed from uh, Andre Karpathy. On the vertical axis here, I'm looking at the types of data. So initially, computer vision worked with a data set that consists of one image called the Lena image. And so 10 to the 0 was the data set size. Then Caltech 101, a um, little more images, Pascal VOC even more, ImageNet even more images, and then the Google Facebook size data sets are even larger. Then a horizontal axis here, the approaches people followed. Initially, people hard-coded what to do with an image. And if you have only one image, you can actually succeed at that. Because, well, you only need to turn that one image into one result. Then we had more images. People started hard-coding image features, like edge detectors. If a small number of images, you might be able to do that. Um, now, when the data sets became larger, for example, when we got to the image net point, it turns out these hard-coded approaches saturated, weren't able to get to really good performance, but training deep neural nets was able to do better. And so what we see happening here is as we go to the right in terms of techniques, these are techniques that require more and more compute, also benefit more and more from having more data, and can solve harder problems. And so the kind of projection that we're seeing here is that as we get more compute and more data, we'll need techniques that are more and more out here to be successful. Let's look at the analog for reinforcement learning. So it used to be that we hard-code controllers. Let's say you want some robot to do something, arm to move somewhere. You hard-code a controller for that. It might, might just work. Um, then we developed things like value iteration, which worked for small dimensional state spaces. Then we went to more complicated algorithms like DQN and the recent policy gradient methods. And then where I'm interested in is where we're headed is this rectangle over here, where we're going to hopefully enable things that these current techniques are not able to, to do. And the reason we're going to be able to do them in the future and nobody's done them in the past is because they'll require an amount of compute that's actually pretty high. Because the computer is going to do most of the lifting. Computer is going to invent the algorithms for us, essentially, rather than us inventing the algorithms, which, of course, is a bigger calculation to do than just solving one problem. But then once the computer has invented the algorithms, then that algorithm that's been invented by the computer can solve many, many problems very quickly. At least that's, that's the hope. OK, so why will Compute continue to increase because, well, there's a lot of money made right now with uh, deep neural nets. And um, people realize that. And people build more and more specialized compute for neural nets. So NVIDIA has been doing that for a while now, but it's not hyper-specialized in neural nets. Google is specializing more. Um, Intel and Nirvana are specialized in neural nets. GraphCore, who will be at the X Colloquium here in two weeks. Cerebras, and so forth. So it's likely by specializing to neural net compute that within the next two years, we have between 10 and 1,000 times somewhere in that range the compute that we have today in a single node. And of course, we'll scale up the cloud even further as is already going on. So the amount of compute that we'll have available will be so much more than we have today, which will allow us to work on the right side of that graph 
and solve problems that are higher up in terms of difficulty. OK, so what's going to be underneath this? Or what, I, what do I think might be underneath this? Um, I think key will be learning to learn. Rather than um, us designing the learning algorithms ourselves, which we've been doing for years and years, and we've only gotten so far, let the computer do more of the lifting for us. Let's see how this might work in reinforcement learning. So again, this is a slide we looked at before. Slow learning is DQN style learning, or any current deep parallel algorithm, not just DQN. All of them are pretty slow. And then humans are much, much faster. The reason these current state-of-the-art algorithms are slow could be because they are fully general algorithms. That is, they can solve any Markov decision process. A Markov decision process, or MDP, is can you think of it as just a mathematical definition of an environment you're interacting with. They can solve any MDP, no matter how it is defined. They're always applicable. But in the real world, what you encounter is only a very small subset of what you can mathematically define. And so it might be that maybe the reason we can solve problems more quickly is because we're attuned to the types of problems that are happening in the real world, not attuned to all mathematically definable problems, which is a very wide set of problems. And so the question becomes, can we discover, that is, learn somehow, fast RL algorithms that take advantage of the fact that you only need to understand a tiny sliver of all possible MDPs, namely the ones that are realistic for our world. <coughs> OK, let's try to formalize this. This will come back a few times, so let's take our time to parse through this. Here's how we're going to try to discover a reinforcement learning algorithm rather than designing it ourselves. So what we want, ultimately, is a reinforcement learning agent parameterized by theta. What could be theta? Could be parameterization of a bunch of code, parameterization of a neural net, could be anything. But somehow, there is something that is going to be our agent. What do we want the agent to do? We want the agent, the agent to be such that if dropped into a MDPM at random, presumably drawn from the realistic MDPs, then on expectation over all trajectories that it'll encounter, it'll collect high reward. And what's important here is that when we look at these trajectories, k from 1 through capital K, there will be a first trajectory. That's your first attempt in the new world. During that attempt, the agent can change its policy. This is not a fixed policy we're trying to find. This is a generic agent. Think of it as like a human. Human gets dropped in an environment, gets an attempt. See what happens while they're acting in that environment. They can change what they do. They can change their strategy. Then the episode is over. Second episode happens in that environment. They've probably updated their strategy quite a lot already, or doing a lot better on the second trial, and can do this capital K times. And so what we're hoping for is somehow discovering this agent that when dropped in a new environment, in capital K episodes in that new environment, collects a lot of reward, even though it's never seen that environment before. Pictorially, let's say capital K was equal to 2. You would be dropped in a first environment as an agent. You get an episode, a second episode. You see how much reward you got total. That's this summation over here. If you got a lot, then you did well. If you didn't get a lot, that means you had a bad agent, and you need to improve your agent. And then you go again in another MDP, and this keeps repeating. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. To do this in a machine learning framework, we're going to have a sample set, a training set of MDPs. And we're going to look at, instead of the expectation over all possible MDPs, we have a set of training MDPs. We sum over those. And in those, look at an expectation. How well does our agent do? All right. Now we need to decide what this agent looks like. We somehow need to learn that agent, learn what it is. And the hope, of course, is that if on all the training MDPs it does really well, then when dropped in a new environment, it's going to do really well, too. For now, here's what we'll do. We'll take for the RL agent a recurrent neural net. Why? A recurrent neural net is a generic compute architecture. If you wish it learned some computer program, then in principle, if your RNN is big enough, it can learn that computer program. If you wanted to learn something else, um, let's say a finite state machine, it can learn that too, and so forth. So it's a generic computation architecture, but the beauty here is that it's differentiable. As you change the parameters a little bit, it'll change a little bit the program that this agent is running. And so you can try to end-to-end -end optimize the computer program that's encoded inside this agent. What does that mean practically? If you change the weights in the recurrent neural net, you're effectively changing the reinforcement learning algorithm that the agent is running internally. If you're changing the activation of the hidden units, 
then that, what that means is that you change the current policy the agent is executing. So you can think of it as still there being a reinforcement learning algorithm and a policy, but it's all living together in the recurrent neural net with the algorithm encoded in the weights, the policy encoded in the activations. And this objective can be optimized with a standard slow reinforcement learning algorithm that will run ahead of time. And after you run that long enough, hopefully we we'll find a good agent that's a fast RL agent that we can use in the future. OK, so the result of this is not going to be a policy. The result of this is going to be an agent, an agent that you can drop in new environments and will adapt quickly to whatever is needed in those new environments. This is in contrast to standard reinforcement learning, where if we optimize something, we end up with a policy, and that policy is tailored to the specific environment you were trained in. Very, very different, doesn't generalize to new environments. OK, to make this explicit, in standard reinforcement learning, you would have an environment, a policy that interacts with the environment by taking actions, getting observations, and then rewards that get fed back to the algorithm that we design. And we hope we design an algorithm that knows how to update that policy such that this becomes a good policy. Okay? And the result is that hopefully we have a policy that masters this one environment. In RL squared, um, we have a recurrent neural net, which is our agent. Let's make it explicit. We want this to become our fast RL agent, takes actions gets observations, also gets to see rewards, which means it can do what a reinforcement learning algorithm usually does, which is based on observation and reward, change its policy, and change how it would act and repeat. It also is faced with many environments, because you want it to learn to adapt to new environments, and that's not possible if you only train in one environment. OK, so the result here is the mastery of a learning process. The result is an agent that's good at learning when faced with new situations. OK, so we evaluate this in a standard reinforcement learning setting, bandits. In bandits, each bandit is an action you can choose. Each bandit has its own distribution over payouts. An episode is one pool, so one choice of a bandit. And then the goal is that you kind of pull the different bandits, and over time you figure out which one has the most payoff, and you keep pulling that one. There are provably optimal algorithms for this. So let's see if we can train our fast RL agent to become as good as a provably optimal algorithm for solving this problem. If we can do that, that's a good proof of concept that indeed we're learning something worthwhile. Turns out we can. So get these indices are asymptotically optimal, highlighted on the left. RL squared learns an agent that achieves almost as much reward, sometimes more, for the bigger problems, a little less still, um, than the Giddens indices. So we're able to learn a faster algorithm, RL algorithm, that when faced with a new bandit problem, can solve it as effectively as the Bayes optimal approach. <coughs> Here's what the learning curves look like. Why are there still learning curves? These are learning curves at meta training time. What's meta training? It's where you're training that fast RL agent. That fast RL agent is faced with a bunch of bandits, gets to try, and then you'll update that recurrent neural net that encodes your agent so that they become a better agent. When next time faced with a new set of bandits, it can learn more quickly. So you actually learns quite quickly. It doesn't need a whole lot of data to master uh, something as good as Gittin's indices. Um, for the bigger problems, when there is, in this case, 500 episodes and then a uh, large number of bandits, then it's a little below Gittin's indices, which are up here. But it's quite remarkable how close it gets. And this is comparing with what the best effort, the result of the best effort a lot of humans have put into solving this kind of problems. And this is just relying on compute rather than human ingenuity to uh, discover this algorithm. We also evaluate on other small random MVPs where there are uh, optimal algorithms available. Again, it's quite close to the optimal algorithms in doing well when dropped in a new environment. Um, here are the learning curves. Um, learns quite quickly when it's a small environment, small number of episodes, a little slower when it's a long number of episodes. Then here's another one. Um, we'll look at half cheetah, a standard locomotion environment in Mujoko. What is the set of tasks? It's the reward can change. The cheetah is always the same cheetah, but a different environment means that the target velocity of the cheetah is different. Sometimes it's forward, sometimes backward, sometimes it's standing still, and it could be forward, backward at different speeds. So as you act in that environment, you'll experience reward, and hopefully from that you understand how fast you should be moving and immediately adapt to that. Um, turns out it adapts pretty much on the second or third time step to that reward signal, and um, immediately you don't even see any exploratory behavior here. It starts, and it right away achieves maximal reward. So it's learned something internal that can generate all possible locomotion behaviors for this cheetah, and immediately zones in on the one that's desired based on the reward it's getting right now. 
Do the same thing um, for ant. Oh, that didn't play. Running forward, backward, different speeds. Again, what we see here is effectively that this agent has mastered something that encodes a prior over all possible locomotion behaviors. And then when it's dropped in a new situation where the reward is associated with one specific locomotion behavior, it immediately adopts, uh, adapts to the reward that's present there and masters that task. So this is very fast RL, maybe even faster than humans at this point. Here's a very challenging task. So what we're going to look at here is an agent in a maze. And the agent does not have access to the map. That's just for our purposes. Agent just sees first person view monocular. Input current image, raw pixels. Output is two degrees to the left, two degrees to the right, or straight, and a couple centimeters of forward progress. That's it. Okay, So very low level vision to very low level action controls. What will happen is agent gets dropped in the maze. What you would hope for is when it gets dropped, a good agent would do, a good agent would understand to move along hallways, check where the target might be, and then when it sees the target, run right to the target, collect a reward. <coughs> then when dropped in the same maze again, it should remember what that maze was like and immediately take the shortest path to the target. If it does that, that would be a well-trained agent. That's what we'd hope for. But Keep in mind, we're not encoding any of that. That's just what we're hoping would be the resulting behavior. So when it's still meta-learning, um, so at the very beginning of meta-learning, this is what happens. It's just bumping into the wall. It doesn't really understand anything yet. It's just bumping into the wall and maybe randomly making some progress every now and then. This is one episode, of course. At meta-training time, I'll have many, many, many of those episodes to train that fast RL agent. Once it's trained the fast RL agent, we deploy it in the new maze on the right. Keep in mind, this fast RL agent will not have access to the map. That's just for us to understand what's happening. This is what the fast RL agent sees right now when it starts, and all it gets is raw pixels streaming into it. It's actually acquired a behavior to quickly run around the maze, look around corners, not waste any energy going into dead ends, and go to the goal. And then second time dropped, it goes right to the goal. So that's exactly what we hope for. Here are some uh, tabular results showcasing that on the second, third, fourth, fifth drop, on average, it'll do better than on the first drop. This here is saying if you dropped in a small maze 91.7% of the time, on the second drop in that maze, you're doing better than on the first drop, meaning you learn something from that first drop that you leveraged in your second drop to get the success more quickly. It doesn't always succeed. It's actually not an easy learning problem to learn the fast RL agent. <clears throat> if the fast RL agent learns well, like the top curves, then you get the kind of behavior that I showed you. But about half the time, actually, the meta learning process does not get enough signal and does not learn that fast RL agent. So there's still a lot of research to be done to make sure that the signal gets there, especially if we go to more difficult environments. This is already pretty difficult, but it's not as hard as the real world, not anywhere close. Um, so still a lot of work to be done to, to get this to learn more effectively. So what we've seen so far is that we've formulated learning to learn as follows. We want to find an agent that does well when dropped in some random environment and gets to try a few times in that environment. We put in a generic agent, a recurrent neural net, and just um, found that that can encode something that learns a good policy very quickly. Can we put more structure into this? Um, Here's one idea. What if we do the following? We say the first two episodes, we execute a policy pi theta. And then after that, we execute a updated policy pi theta plus delta theta, where delta theta is an update we apply to the parameter vector theta. So this is a very classical approach to solving this kind of problem. Reinforcement learning would do this. You start with the policy, then you update the policy, and you go again. Okay? So and then how you obtain the update, maybe a policy gradient, A3C, TRPO, PPO, any of the standard um, deep RL algorithms could provide an update for you. And then you hope that this thing does well. Well, for this to do well, you need to start at a really good theta. And so the hope that we have here in this approach is that maybe there is some kind of initialization we can work from, from where it's fast to adapt to new tasks. Okay? So this actually, we can look at this in a much more general setting. Um, we'll call this model agnostic meta-learning. Um, we assume here, or we hope for, a set of pre-trained parameters theta, such that 
after an update, let's say a graded update based on the training loss, um, that we get a new theta and that that new theta actually does well on the task. So we don't care about how well the original theta does, we care about how after one update, the resulting theta, how well that one fares on the task that we're trying to solve. Why well, might we hope this might work? Look, for example, at computer vision. People train on ImageNet and then care about something else, and all they do is fine tune on that new data set, and often that actually works. What that means is that somehow by training on ImageNet, you're able to discover a neural net that is such that with a small number of gradient updates, you will do well in a new computer vision task. Well, maybe the same could be true for reinforcement learning. Maybe you can find a neural net that is such that just with a small number of gradient updates, that neural net becomes good at a new task. OK, so here's what it looks like um, pictorially. We would have many, many tasks, in this case, three on the slide. They each would have optimal policy parameter settings. And we'd hope that we find some theta that lies between them and such that a gradient update would right away take us to whichever one we're faced with right now um, and solve the problem. We actually tried this on the same kind of environments that we looked at er earlier with RL squared. Um, here, what you see is you would, see, you would do a bunch of rollouts under the pi theta, the initial pi theta, then do a gradient step. And what you see is that after one gradient step, it actually acquires a good policy. Um, if you just pre-train, it doesn't work too well. But if you do this cleverly with model agnostic meta-learning, you see that after one gradient step, it immediately acquires a good behavior. It turns out that one gradient step is a little slower than what RL squared would do. RL squared uh, even updates within the episode and actually after one time step already does an update and, and acquires the behavior. Um, so in this particular setting, RL squared tends to learn a little faster. Um, but um, I think there's a lot of interesting results to be had by exploiting this structure. And we'll see some a little later um, where it's not obvious how you would do RL squared. And this actually will work um, very well. Here, top is if you do just random initialization and then policy gradients from there. Bottom is if you pre-train to find as good theta using MAML, and then from there take gradient steps and you adapt very quickly to the new task. OK, so what we've seen so far is a setting of learning to reinforcement learn, where you get dropped in an MDP and another MDP and so forth. And when you get dropped in an MDP, you're supposed to do really well after a, few, uh, after a small amount of experience in that MDP. We've used the black box agent in RL squared, and we've used uh, model agnostic meta learning, um, which is depicted here. We can actually think about the same ideas in the context of imitation learning. It's another way to acquire skills for a robot. Imitation learning has had many, many successes, um, but classical successes tend to operate in this regime. You collect many demonstrations for your task, your imitation learning algorithm from that generates a policy which can do something well in that environment. When you train for assembling a chair, you start from scratch. Next time, you train for assembling a table, and so forth. There's no sharing. What is shared is the algorithm for learning, but then the data is not shared in any way, and you need to learn from scratch for every new setting. What we'd like to do instead is learn a one-shot imitator. What is this? This is a network that is trained through meta-learning, such that when it sees one example of a task, it understands what the task is and can already solve it. Much like humans, once you've seen Somebody demonstrates something once, you understand what they're trying to do. Why? Because you've seen them do many things before. And so you have a lot of context. That context is where you get to see at meta training time many demonstrations of many tasks. From that, you extract the essence of task inside this neural net. And then when you get one demonstration of a new task, you understand what the essence is of that new task and are able to do it. So then the way you get a policy is by combining this one-shot imitator with a single demonstration, and together they'll make up the policy. You give a new demonstration, together there'll be a new policy. How can you train this? Um, here's one way to train this. Um, you have a video of a demonstration. You have a current frame of another demonstration for the same task. So at training time, you need paired uh, executions in some sense. Like you need two demonstrations of the same task. So if you wanted to do assembling a chair, you need twice the demonstration of assembling a chair, not just once. Um, so assembly chair here, or stack some blocks here, stack some blocks here. Then what you do here is this neural net takes in this entire video, processes it, takes in the current frame here, does some more processing, and predicts what motor torques would be applied over here. If it can do that, then it means that in the future, from one demonstration, it can predict what to do in a new situation that's related to that one demonstration. 
So we can train this end to end, and this, what's sitting in the red box here, is our one-shot imitator. It's a lot of detail that goes into the architecture to make this work, but this is the high-level picture. We tested it for block stacking. A task instance here is a specific final configuration of the blocks. Maybe D onto C onto B onto A. That would be one task instance. What you'll see on the left here is the demonstration. On the right, the policy that is executed by the one-shot imitator. So you'll see that it's achieving a certain block stacking configuration here. And from that one demonstration, this robot is achieving the same block stacking configuration. It's doing this at the level of controlling the motion of the gripper. So it's, it's not just commanding the robot, oh, now pick up block A and place it there. It's actually controlling at the level of uh, the gripper motions, velocity, and uh, angular rate of the gripper uh, based on what it's seeing on the left. What you see at the bottom here is which blocks it's paying attention to, currently I and J. And what you see here is which time slices it's paying attention to in the demonstration. To get demonstrations, we actually scripted demonstrations because we need a lot of demonstrations to train this one-shot imitator. And so what you see here is our scripted demonstrator, how well it does on training tasks and on test tasks. So even our demonstrations are not perfect. Now let's look at how well our one-shot imitator does, almost as well as our scripted demonstrator. So it's learned everything that that demonstrator is able to give. Um, we have a few variants here where you might look only at keyframes or only look at the end frame and see if that's more effective to learn from than looking at the entire video. Turns out it's more effective when you take in the entire video. It's a lot more data, so you might be worried about signal to noise, but somehow it gets the right thing out of that and learns more. Here's another way to go about this. What I showed you for now was the black box approach. Very much like RL squared is just this black box RNN that's supposed to acquire a RL agent on the inside. What I showed you here was a black box neural net becoming a one-shot imitator. Now we'll look at the mammal counterpart. So the mammal counterpart is where you say, grain descent is a great learning procedure. Let's keep that intact and let it not, don't force it to relearn that part. Just hard code the grain descent part and see what we can do from there. So a typical way to do imitation learning is to say, well, we see an action. Then our neural net from the observation should output something close to that action, and that's our loss predicting actions as closely as possible over a wide range of tasks and time slices into the task. Meta-learning loss would be something like this then. What we want is we want it to be the case that we train a neural net with parameter vector theta such that if we see one demonstration and then we run behavioral cloning, which is we optimize against this loss, the standard imitation learning loss, we do one gradient step on that loss, that will give us an updated parameter vector theta theta minus alpha grad, grad theta and so forth. This updated parameter vector is the one that we want to perform well. And we're going to measure the loss of that updated parameter vector. And if that's good, then that means we can learn from one gradient update from one demonstration. Here's the neural net architecture going from raw pixels all the way to torques. And what I showed you earlier with the block stacking, we went from state to, to kinematic control. Here we go all the way from pixels to robot action. So it's this includes all the visual processing being learned. Maybe more possible here, thanks to putting a little more structure into what's going underneath. At training time, meta training time, the robot gets to play with these objects, gets to get demonstrations on these objects, and trains this parameter vector theta that should make it ready to imitate quickly. At testing time, it'll see new objects. So it's supposed to be able to learn to manipulate a new object it's never seen before from one demonstration. Here's the single demo. It's a pushing task here. There's two objects on the table. It decided to push the, the chess piece. That was the demo. So what we hope for is that if faced with a situation with those two objects on the table, no matter where they are, the robot would understand that the chess piece has to be pushed to the red circle. Let's see if that happens. Um, indeed, just from that one demonstration, it's acquired a policy that goes all the way from raw pixels to motor commands to succeed at this task. And this is actually what the robot sees. So these are the pixels the robot is processing and just gets that one demonstration to learn this. Here's another one. Here, the demonstrator pushes the um, big pink object. And indeed, the learn policy does the same thing. Here's another one. Demonstrator pushes the big yellow cube. And the learn policy is, again, from just one update, 
uh, have acquired the ability mostly to push that one to the target. Here's something we did with a real robot. So here we have, again, we're now going to place objects onto targets. On the left are the objects seen at training time when the initialization of the neural net parameter vector theta is learned. And then at test time, we'll show things with the other objects. So this is test time, one demo, placing that apple into the circular ball, and then imitation. And we're seeing the robot's view here. So the robot learned this from raw pixels from one demonstration that this is the thing to do. Here's another one. It goes to the red cube, and it also learned to do that. OK, so at this point, we're done with kind of the main concepts I wanted to get across in this talk. I want to give you some hints at future directions related to this, teach you a few things that I think I can teach pretty quickly, that are some good insights for RL, and then point out a few future directions. Turns out you can reformulate what we just saw to learn from video only. OK, so this is what we just looked at. MAML for mutation learning will optimize this loss, which is how good your parameter vector theta is after one update. Nobody says that the update you do on the inside has to use the same loss as what you use on the outside. So what we'll do is we'll actually put a different loss on the inside. This will be, instead of predicting the action that was taken by the demonstrator, which might not be available in practice. If it's a human doing it, you're not going to know their motor commands. You're just going to be able to watch them. So instead, in the inside here, we'll predict the next frame that we'll see. We'll do video prediction effectively. We have a loss on what we'll see. And that loss is living inside a neural net that is shared with the neural net that will do control. And somehow, we're going to initialize this parameter vector theta through meta training that one update on video prediction is enough to result in a neural net that is good at controlling this robot. So this will be a neural net with two heads, one related to predicting video, the other one related to the torque commands that need to be output. Actually, so these results are, are um, in progress and very promising, but I don't have any, any videos to show just yet. Here's another thing that we can uh, vary here. Learning to explore. Exploration is a big problem in reinforcement learning. How do you explore? People come with a lot of ideas. Uh, exploration bonuses, um, pseudo counts, um, maybe um, something about uh, variational information maximization. Do you learn something new about the dynamics of the environment and so forth? Very complicated heuristics. Well, if we have more and more compute, why don't we let the computer figure out how exploration should happen? We can look at the same setting as we looked at before. But the basic idea now becomes we don't care how much reward was collected in the first episode, only how much was collected in the second episode. That means the first episode is free. That means the first episode should be an exploratory episode, where this RL agent has learned that in episode one, I do a lot of exploration, very smart, so I learn as much as possible about the environment. Because then in episode two, I can collect a lot of reward. So just a very small tweak to everything we've already seen. It's just a tiny change in the objective. It's all it, all it takes. And you can start uh, learning to explore. Um, so here's the standard objective. And here's the learn to explore objective, which only considers the reward from a certain time onwards. That doesn't mean the agent doesn't have access to rewards accumulated early on. Of course, the agent sees the rewards that are happening, but they don't contribute to the reward that's being optimized for. They're just for learning about the environment. Here are some example environments in which we're testing this. So we call it crazy world. Um, in crazy world, there's nine tile types. You could have gold in a tile. That's great. That's what you want to collect. There could be ice, which means you slip over it. Could be death, which is where the episode ends. Um, could be a wall, you just can't go there. Could be a lock, uh, which means you can't go through. But if you have a key, then you can. So you can go collect a key. There are teleporter squares. There are energy squares. This here is how much energy you got left at the bottom. You're out of energy. You're also in death mode. Um, and then um, normal squares. Uh, there are also where nothing special happens. We swap the layouts. We swap out color palettes, dynamics. So moving up might not mean moving up, and so forth. Um, and those are some sample instances. And what you'd hope for in this kind of environment is that an agent would be dropped in it, try out what the meaning is of the different squares, maybe also understand that usually there is a lot of normal squares. So whatever there is the most of is probably the normal squares. And then understand from what it's seen in the past how to very quickly do the right thing in a new situation by some quick exploration first. So here's an agent in action. 
exploring in this world. This agent is running around, the red dot, and it's quickly trying out all the different things that are available in this environment. And from just a few episodes of exploration, able to figure out how this environment works and start collecting a lot more reward in future episodes. Here's a game we've been testing this on, this work in progress. Um, the way we test this here is we look at um, different levels in the game. So most video games have multiple levels. We train on some levels. From that, it builds up a prior of how the system works, and then we test it in a level it's never played before and see how fast it can acquire uh, a good policy. What you're watching here is something where we're, we're watching one game in action. In parallel, there's 31 games running. And so when you, when you think it only had one experience, it's had 32. Um, but this is still an extremely low amount of experience to learn to play a new level in a game um, that it's, it's never seen this game level before. Here's another thing to think about. Um, when I talked about meta-learning here, learning to learn, I've all, always been talking in the context of action, be it reinforcement learning or imitation learning. So I'll do some work on that in the context of optimization just as well, including from Chaturna Malik here at, at Berkeley. Um, some work on this in the context of generative models, um, how to learn to generate something similar to what you recently saw, um, and also in the context of classification. Once you have classified a certain number of categories, if somebody presents you with a new category, how fast can you understand that category? And a common example would be if you've never seen a segue before, you see one of them, now you know what a segue is, you don't need to see 100 of them. Because you already have a notion of what a category is, you can quickly zone in on new categories. So what it would be is at test time, you get to see five images with five labels, and then you get uh, test images, and you're supposed to classify those. And you've never seen any of those five categories before. You're supposed to acquire those new categories on the fly instantly. That's very similar to needing to learn to act in a new environment instantly, um, just slightly simpler. So training time, you do something similar. You would face yourself with what is a disjoint set of classes and pre pretend going through this exercise, train end-to-end, -end, differentiate through the whole process to optimize for this and becoming good at recognizing things you've never seen before. Turns out that the model agnostic meta learning that I presented to you, which um, we thought of in the context of reinforcement learning, outperforms the existing um, meta learning methods for classification, even though it's unlike the existing methods, not specific to classification at all. It's a much more general idea than what's being used in any of these other methods that are much more attuned to trying to solve classification, both on OmniGlot and on MiniImageNet, which are the standard benchmarks. Here's another thing we're looking at, learning to grade. You might wonder, when are we going to run into like a new class and a new class again, new class again? Why don't we just train ahead of time for all the classes we care about? Well, you compose a new exam, new questions, new student answers. So we can do the same thing there. You can, for example, categorize questions as simple multiple choice type questions, meta train on a lot of them from the past, and then quickly learn to grade from a few examples how to grade new ones. Um, same for complex multiple choice, for fill in the blank, for more complex fill in the blank, for diagrams, and for short answer. And so this is all a work in progress that hopefully will uh, be released in the next couple of months. OK. One thing you also might want to consider is the architecture you use underneath. What I've described to you when I say a big RNN for RL squared, what, what should that structure be? Not all RNNs are the same. And in fact, you decide not to use an RNN. Recently, for sequence to sequence, people have noticed that WaveNet type architectures, dilated convolutions, work really, really well. So we can actually swap in a WaveNet for the RNN and run RL squared again the exact same way, just with a WaveNet rather than an RNN. If we do that, this is what it would look like. Um, we actually get better results on bandits. It's a work in progress on some other environments. Um, for image recognition, we actually get better results than any of the uh, things I've shown in any of the state of the art out there. There's a new state of the art doing WaveNet-like processing on sequences of images and labels to get uh, best classification performance on new images in new categories that you hadn't seen at meta training time. Um, state of the art on OmniGlot, state of the art on Mini ImageNet, and actually uh, quite a bit ahead of even just state of the art results from less than a, a year ago. OK, here are two quick insights I want to share with you. 
Um, often in reinforcement learning, there is not a lot of signal. What do we mean with signal? If there's zero reward, you don't know what to do. You can't learn anything. If you need to pick up an object, place it somewhere, and you only get reward when it's there, then it, as long as you don't do the job, you're not getting reward. Here's an idea to get around this. It's called hindsight experience replay. It's probably easiest to think about in the context of just humans might too. Um, let's say you wanted to go eat pizza, and you end up in the ice cream place, and you ate ice cream instead. Okay? You could say, well, zero reward, because you're supposed to eat pizza, and you didn't eat pizza, zero reward, you can learn nothing. Or you could say, if just I had wanted to eat ice cream, I would have gotten really high reward. So what, what, how can I use the fact that if just I had wanted to eat ice cream, I would have gotten high reward, and turn that into a learning signal for learning anything else that we might want to do in the future? OK, so for that, we need universal Q functions that take in state, goal, and action, not just state and action, which is the typical thing. Once you use a universal Q function, your replay buffer, which traditionally consists of State, action, reward, and state will also include the goal that you had. Standard experience replay will look at this Bellman equation. Don't worry if you're not familiar with this. If you are familiar with this, this will be very clear. Um, you're looking at the Bellman error, trying to minimize it. Um, well, with hindsight experience replay, you will swap in goals that you actually experienced and corresponding rewards such that you get non-zero reward signal and can learn a lot more quickly. Very simple thing to do. Very simple modification to standard DQN, but gives you a lot more signal, can learn things a lot more quickly. Here's an example of a robot learning some skills. So what you'll see here on the left is standard uh, DDPG, which uses Q learning underneath. And then, on, sorry, on the left is our approach, and on the right is the approach without the hindsight experience replay. And so what you'll see is that on the left, it effectively learns in a very small number of attempts, whereas on the right, it doesn't learn anything because it never gets a good amount of signal to learn from. One on the right only learns when it achieves something, otherwise it gets zero signal, so it needs to effectively solve the task before it can learn about solving the task, whereas the one on the left can do anything and learn from that and then generalize to new goals. This works for a wide range of tasks. Um, here's another quick insight. Um, standard Atari setting, you'd output, you have an output on your neural net for each possible actions, each possible action. Um, if your actions are continuous, you can't do that. So you want to take it as an input. Um, but then how do you generate actions? Max overall actions is not clear. You can actually set up an inference network, pi phi, that samples from the exponentiated Q values. If you do that, you can actually do Q learning on continuous control problems in very effective ways. This is the Baxter, uh, the Sawyer robot over in Satar Jedi, um, one of Sergey Levin's robots, um, learning in about two hours to learn to stack a block with model-free reinforcement learning. OK, so where is this headed? I think one big thing is that we'll, since we want to rely on more compute, we'll need to rely on simulation. I'm going to go fast here. The key idea I want to get across here is that it turns out that your simulator does not need to be that realistic to be helpful. It's enough to have a lot of randomization in your simulator. If it randomizes enough, it'll have the right signal for you. And you can learn things. In fact, you can learn from these images. None of those look realistic. But what you learn from these images is good enough when faced with a real image to still do the right thing and pick out the object that you want to pick out. Train a neural net based on only simulated images, deploy it on a real robot that sees real images, and actually knows to find the block and go grab it. So key here is enough randomization uh, is enough to make this succeed. You don't need realism. In fact, you don't even need pre-training. So you might think pre-train on ImageNet and then do this. The red curve is pre-train on ImageNet. It helps you in the beginning, but ultimately it doesn't help you. So you can actually do this cleanly without any pre-training. The two core ingredients of AI are planning and learning. If you take, let's say, 188 here, two core components of the class are planning and learning. Last 10 years, all we've seen is like major booms in learning and not that much attention to planning. It's likely in the near future, we'll see a lot of combinations of planning and learning uh, do more interesting things that you can do with just learning. We worked on value iteration networks here, worked on something very related that enables um, vision-based navigation of uh, a car. This is a car navigating in Cory Hall based on raw pixels, uh, executing motor commands. And this is using a combination of planning and learning to be able to do this. Here's another example, Sokoban, a um, standard game. You're supposed to push blocks, well, little circles, to their target locations. We need to be careful about your strategy, because you could lock in 
uh, one of these purple dots somewhere and you can, could not get behind them anymore and be stuck. Um, and it turns out by combining classical A-star search planning with learning a heuristic for this, it's possible to solve problems that classical approaches cannot solve and just learning cannot solve either. Here's another way to combine planning and learning. It turns out that it's possible, and this is quite surprising to me, um, to take in a video, see the first frame of another situation that's similar, and fully predict what the video will look like if you were to watch from here. Once you can predict that video, you can then try to control your robot to make that video happen. So you plan by imagining the future, visually seeing the future, and then you try to make it happen. What you see here on the left is the video the robot gets to see. The middle is a still frame, is the initial frame. And then the right column every time is what the robot imagine, the robot's imagination is of what should happen to achieve what was happening on the left. You can see the thing on the right is quite a different situation from one on the left. It's related but different. It actually extrapolates from the first frame forward and understands what is supposed to happen. The last thing I think will be very important in the near future is continual learning. What do I mean with that? And what is it? why do we need it? The current machine learning paradigm tends to be step one, learn, step two, deploy. Why is machine learning useful in this paradigm? Because it's too difficult to hand code a solution to the problem, so you want to learn the solution and then deploy. But all the learning happens ahead of time. It's learning, then deploy, strict separation. But for real deployments, the world is going to be continually changing, and your system needs to adapt to those changes at all times. And so what we need is continual learning rather than one-time learning and deployment. You can actually phrase it in a very similar way to what we're looking at with MAML. What we're doing now is we're going to try to find an agent parameterized by theta, MAML as well as RL squared, agent parameterized by theta that is good when faced with a sequence of environments. So the agent at training time will be continually faced with changing environments. And the hope is that what this agent would do would internalize this. It sees the current environment. It sees the next environment. And it can now anticipate what the next, next environment will be like and be better at the next, next environment because it understands how the world evolves over time. And so that would be better than an agent that always reacts after the fact, oh, the world changed. I need to change my behavior. With this kind of training, you hope you can anticipate future changes. We looked at this in the context of uh, Robo Sumo. So we put two robots on a mat, and they have to push the other one off. If you push the other one off, you win the game. Or you flip the other one over, you win the game too. Here is an ant, which was trained with meta-learning, which means it has learned to anticipate changes in the world. What are the changes in the world here is that both of these agents are learning. And so because they're both learning, if you can see how the other one is learning and then anticipate what their behavior will be in the future, you can beat them in the future. And that's exactly what's happening here. The red one is using that strategy. Initially, it's weaker. It starts out weaker. But thanks to its anticipatory capabilities of how the other one is changing, um, it's able to beat it. The other one is using regular reinforcement learning, whereas the red one is using meta learning. Actually, you can take this to the extreme. If you put these creatures in a world where some of them are meta learners, some are regular reinforcement learners, some are ants, some are bugs, some are spiders, and you let them play each other, let's say for 100 episodes, you see who won the most, where they're both constantly evolving, and so the one that evolves better will win more towards the end. Then after 100 episodes, you retain the one that won, and you repeat. You get a population, uh, you get a population dynamics game, and here's how that plays out. So what we hope for, if meta-learning is helpful, that meta-learning would result in more stable creatures that can do well in these one-on-one -on -one fights and will survive and be in the next generation. What you see here is um, initially it's uniform distribution, but then over time, red starts to dominate. Red is effectively um, RL squared, which we saw early on trained in the context of where the environment is evolving over time. And so RL squared trained in that context outperforms regular learners or stationary policies who don't know how to adapt to the world. And so this, I mean, to a great extent is inspired by, if we think about human intelligence, um, 
maybe the reason we have to be so smart is not so much because the world is so complex, but because the people around us are so smart. We need to essentially always be better than the pers other person around us, understand are they going to take our food from us? Are they going to be our friends, not our friends? And so a lot of the complication of what we learn and why we're smart is not because of just finding food, but because the population that we live in and we're constantly competing. And that maybe by setting up these competitive environments, we can actually, in a very simple way, create some very strong intelligences that are very difficult to create otherwise, because otherwise there would be no driver to create intelligence. But due to competition, there will always be a driver to become smarter, because whoever is smarter will do better, and so that way you drive up the intelligence. Okay, these are the current and future directions. Here are the topics I covered. Thank you very much. I'd also like to open it up for questions, so please raise your hand if you have a question, and I will run the mic to you. While the shuffling happens, let me start out with a question. So, um, you mentioned in um, the big role that simulation is playing here. What are, what are the domains? You've shown us some domains where simulation is extremely successful. What are the domains where simulation is really hard or not applicable that you think are the toughest nuts to crack? So where simulation worked really, really well was perception, actually. So the example I show was a little fast, but was pure perception. The vis doom. Um, no, the, um, the robot grabbing the blocks. Yeah. So there there was training in unrealistic renderings and was good enough to learn a vision system that understands the essence, that is the geometry. It can abstract away lighting conditions, occluders, color, texture, and just focus on geometry. Um, where simulation has, for now, still more trouble is modeling detailed physical dynamics. Um, and maybe there'll be some progress in the near future, how to randomize that. But it's a little less obvious how to randomize in a way that captures what we need to capture when, let's say, in simulation, you work with a rope. How do you make sure when you work with a rope in the real world, somehow what you learn in simulation carries over? And some of these dynamical systems are seemingly quite complex to learn something in simulation and actually have it work in the real world. Um, I think where the simulator potentially gets most interesting is the sh thing I showed at the end, which is the notion where actually you can build a very simple simulator. You just need to limit the resources that you make available such that there is a natural competition between the agents. And so what that means is that you don't need to design a complex environment. Let's say you want to build intelligence by, let's say, building a beautiful self-driving car simulator, as realistic as the real world, that's an enormous amount of work. Um, and that's one way to get to self-driving cars, maybe. But another way to potentially get there, and maybe not the fastest way, because it would be a slightly roundabout way, but you would get a lot more is if you set up environments where agents have to compete. Because then they have to continuously outsmart the other, and you constantly get signal, because usually they're at the same level, so they kind of win half-half. If one of them does something a little better, they'll get signaled to become smarter, and this might be able to repeat. Um, it requires a lot of compute, admittedly. Um, so we'll probably need more compute than we have today, but maybe not more than we have a year from now. Other questions? For meta-learning, how can we tell apart actual learning to learn to do the task versus just learning to do the task? It seems like you need a notion of like task distance or generalization to tell these apart. Yeah, so the question here is, in some sense, how well would a zero-shot generalization perform? Where it, can, you, can you do a new task from the zero th attempt, in which case it's regular generalization, versus you need one example and acquire a lot of information from that one example to then do the task? Um, what we did, I didn't have the results here, for the mazes, we did an explicit test for that by looking at small mazes only and see if it can learn to solve bigger mazes. So it could have never acquired the notion of bigger maze in the small mazes. Um, but I think there's a lot more to be thought through there in how to, and I think that's a big, actually one of the big things that's, that's challenging in, in meta-learning is how to define a wide range of tasks. And so um, in some sense, it's, it's funny coincidence, but let's say you look at computer vision, right? How do you define a wide range of tasks? Um, turns out like there is ImageNet, but then there's still only that many categories. It's still limited what you'd have. 
And so it turns out that grading might be a good example because there's so many categories. Um, but in general, it might be that the only way to get a lot of tasks is actually by having opponents and trying to exploit the dynamics of opponents introducing new tasks in your world. And so you're faced with a new opponent. Adapting to that new opponent might require learning something new that you didn't learn before. Uh, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask about your um, quickly teachable insights research. Um, I know that you have worked on, and uh, other reinforcement learning researchers have worked on, um, multi-part training systems where either you have multiple agents or you have multiple tasks. Um, have you extended these research to um, more complicated training regimes where you have um, you know, auxiliary tasks or you have um, multiple agents having to um, be trained to work together? Sure, yeah. So there's a few, few directions there. In terms of auxiliary tasks, um, there's some work actually that Evan did um, for a while here up front on introducing auxiliary losses related to dynamics prediction. And that way, recover a neural net that's at the same time a next state or next frame predictor, as well as a um, action predictor. And by doing so, you might learn a representation more quickly. Um, DeepMind's done some work there. Unreal is a paper that comes to mind where they would predict where pixels would be at the next time, um, or if it would achieve a certain pixel configuration. And that would help um, learn the thing it actually cares about more quickly. Um, the, the context that you see here, um, one way it's happening is that as these, in the last part, if the ants, spiders, and bugs play against each other in the robot sumo game, um, they actually start from the same neural net, or many of them start from the same neural net. They play each other, and by playing each other, they actually are at the, they're playing an opponent that's at the same level as themselves. And because you're playing an opponent that's roughly at the same level as yourself, you win about half the time, lose about half the time, and you actually get a lot of signal. Um, and so you get an automatic curriculum where you automatically face harder and harder and harder tasks as you go along. It's also some work we've done where we've explicitly designed curriculums where you would change the task itself. You'd say, this task is easier, this is harder, harder, harder. And that way is another way to get signal into the whole process. Um, I would say that's still an open problem to do that fully automatically. Definitely humans are pretty good at designing curriculums. Designing simple problems and then medium, medium problems, hard problems, and then have the robot first train on easy, then medium, then hard, and learn things gradually rather than right away going into the hard problems. Um, overall, I would say auxiliary losses haven't helped as much in RL as you might hope for. Then, I mean, maybe it's not too surprising because same in computer vision, straight up training on ImageNet works quite well, and doing unsupervised learning doesn't help a whole lot in those contexts either. So it might just be that we don't have the right machinery to, to really give it a, a major boost through unsupervised learning. All right, we have one more question. <coughs> um, it seems to me that most of the, uh, or perhaps all of the meta-learning tasks, so especially the bandits, all of those sub MDPs are very structurally similar. Uh, and so basically what the agent is sort of learning to do is interpolate between the different environments it can find itself in. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been here before, it's been here, you put it here, it's gonna say, oh, I'm in between those two period previous experiences, I know what to do. Mm -hmm. People can do something that's more like extrapolation, where mm -hmm. you solve a simple problem, and then you can actually like, add a new dimension, or really like mm -hmm. make it structurally much more complex, but it has some core similarity, and they still are able to g generalize in that case. Mm -hmm. Do you think you have any evidence that this kind of algorithm can work? And if not, what would it need to be able to do that kind of extrapolation? So the last example, the continual learning, tries to go in that direction. And the way it tries to go there is by the agent through a lifetime is faced with an easier problem at first, then harder, harder, harder. And it's supposed to learn to anticipate how things get more complicated. And by anticipating how things get more complicated, it can do better, as shown from the population dynamics, than agents that don't anticipate. So it's not exactly what you're referring to. I think what you're referring to is a really good problem to try to tackle. But it's going a little bit in that direction. And the way it was going there is by setting up a loss function at training time that specifically tries to do well as you go through a progression of difficulties. Difficulties here defined by the other agent also becoming better. 
And so you could imagine doing something similar where you have a progression of difficulties of tasks. And as you train, it always has to go through a progression. And if you can define a wide enough family of progressions that see tasks become more difficult, then when faced with yet another task, then maybe just faced with the first version of that task, you can quickly also acquire the ability to solve the more complicated versions. Um, remains to be seen, though. And maybe it needs a completely different approach. I think it's a good problem to think about. Good. At this point, I think we should conclude the, uh, the public Q&A. Maybe some of you will have individual questions. Let's thank Peter again. Thank you, Bjorn.